So it's a great pleasure to have Professor Alexander Bilenki from Tufts University. And he's the uh, Leonard Jin Home uh, Bernstein Professor and, uh, of Evolutionary Science and the Director of Institute of Cosmology at Tufts. He works on many aspects, quantum aspects of primordial cosmology. Uh, I will not give very big introduction to him because everybody knows what Alex do. Today, Alex will talk about uh, black holes from cosmic inflation. And uh, thank you, Alex, for uh, your time and uh, uh, allow, uh, uh, like agreeing to give this talk in the QASTM Zoominar series. So you are the 33th speaker in this series and uh, we are welcoming you from the Potsdam. Thank you very much. You can start. Okay, thank you for the introduction and uh, it's a pleasure to give a talk to this audience. Um, so I would like to tell you about a new mechanism of black hole formation in the early universe, basically do, as a result during inflation. It starts during inflation and completes later, uh, but still in the early universe. Um, it's based on the theory of cosmic inflation. So the, this is the outline of the talk. Um, I'll start with a brief review of the inflation scenario, emphasizing the relevant, asp relevant aspects. And um, then I'll discuss how black holes are formed. And finally, some in interesting obs observational implications that this scenario offers. Um, so inflation is a period of very fast accelerated expansion in the early universe. And there are many models of inflation. Uh, in most models, the, this expansion is driven by the potential energy uh, of a scalar field. Uh, we don't know exactly what the scalar field is, so it goes by the generic name, the inflaton. Um, and uh, what we require for the scalar field that it has a potential uh, which has a flat region, like the one showed here. Um, this vertical axis is the potential energy density. Uh, and if you imagine that this field phi is uniform in space, then its dynamics is pretty similar to the dynamics of this little ball rolling on in this landscape. And the expansion of the universe acts pretty much like friction. So the friction slows down the ball and it rolls very slowly on this gentle slope. So the kinetic energy of the field can be neglected and uh, the potential energy is nearly constant as it rolls, right? Because it stays at nearly the same height. <clears throat> as a result, the energy contained in space is proportional to the volume of that region, right? Like shown here. And from this, from this thermodynamic equality, that pressure is equal to minus the EDV, it follows immediately that the pressure is negative. Pressure is equal to minus energy density, which means that the pressure actually is the tension. Instead of pushing outwards, as pressure usually does, it pulls inwards. An important consequence of that is that the state of matter of this scalar field has repulsive gravity. Uh, so this is uh, one of the Friedman's equations uh, a is the scale factor, which tells you by how much the universe expanded as a function of time. And uh, a double dot is the acceleration of expansion. So normally for ordinary matter, pressure is negligible compared to energy density. And so this right hand side of this equation is negative and the universe expands with deceleration. It slows down as you would expect because gravity slows down the expansion. 
But in this case of inflation, when P is equal to minus rho, the right-hand side is positive. And so the expansion of the universe accelerates. Um, also, um, because uh, rho and P are nearly constant during inflation, the solution of this equation is an exponential. Uh, this exponentially expanding universe is uh, the space-time called the De Sitter space, and um, so Alex, I have a question here. So mm -hmm. this age, the Hubble parameter is exactly constant. If it is so, then you can't stop inflation. No, no, because it is not. It is not exact. It is approximately constant because because there is a slope here, right? So so you need to stop inflation at certain point, right? Because this ball rolls down, although slowly, and eventually it gets to this minimum, which corresponds to our present vacuum, right? So then it oscillates and dumps its energy in some other fields. Hmm. Uh, so, um, yeah, so this H parameter in the exponent um, depends on the energy density rho, and the higher the energy density, the faster is expansion. Uh, yeah, and I'll be using units with speed of light equal to one throughout. Uh, this the Sitter space has a, an important property that it has a horizon. Uh, horizon distance is H inverse, and it is uh, typically a tiny microscopic distance. Uh, and its importance is in the fact that any no communication is possible uh, between points separated by distances greater than this horizon. So if you have two observers in the sitter space, they're driven apart by the expansion, and once their distance becomes greater than this, their communication stops. Okay, so this is basically all we need to know uh, to discuss inflationary scenario. So what this scenario assumes is that uh, at some time in the early universe, some region of space was in this state with the field phi somewhere over here. Um, this region does not have to be large. It only needs to be larger than this horizon, H inverse. And once you have that, the region begins to inflate, expand exponentially, and it expands by a huge factor in a relatively short period of time. Eventually, the field rolls down the hill and uh, it, the energy in the field thermalizes and produces hot plasma, which is in this picture represented by this red stuff. Um, and uh, this plasma continues to expand by inertia, uh, but from then on, the universe follows along the lines of the standard Big Bang cosmology. So now you have a hot universe, you have a large universe, and, and this expense uh, explains uh, some features of the Big Bang that seemed to be very puzzling before the scenario was introduced. So it explains the high temperature, why the universe was so hot. This is because it started with this high energy of the infraton field. Uh, the large scale homogeneity of the universe, and this is due to the fact that this, um, uh, during inflation, the energy is nearly constant, so it is energy density. It explains the flatness of the universe, that the geometry on large scales is very close to flat Euclidean geometry. Uh, and this is because if you imagine that the universe was initially very curved, let's say a spherical universe, then you expand it by a huge factor, and you can see only a small part of it, so it appears to us flat. And finally, um, it explains the small density perturbations uh, that later evolve into galaxies and uh, larger structures. 
And this, uh, the origin of these fluctuations is due to quantum fluctuations during inflation. The theory of that was developed by these two fellows. Uh, so this inflationary scenario is, uh, uh, makes a number of predictions. One of them is the flatness of the universe and another is the spectrum of density perturbations. Uh, and they are, have very impressive uh, observational support. Uh, much of it comes from observations of the cosmic background radiation and these satellite missions. So you get a map of the intensity of radiation over the sky uh, and uh, then you Fourier transform it, or rather expand in spherical harmonics and plot the power spectrum. And here the agreement between the predicted spectrum, which is this green line, and the observed, which is red dots, is rather spectacular. And also the flat geometry predicted by inflation is confirmed also with high accuracy. Um, okay. So we should take this scenario seriously and uh, trust the predictions that, other predictions that it makes. Um, so now I would like to tell you how black holes can be formed uh, in this scenario. This is based on work I did with uh, Jaume Garriga and my former students, Jun Zhang and Helen Deng. Okay, so first uh, let me uh, point out that apart from this hypothetical inflaton field, um, particle physics models include a number of other scalar fields. We know that at least one extra scalar field exists and this is the Higgs field, uh, but uh, Particle physics models like grand unified models include a number of Higgs-like fields and string theory uh, suggests that there should be hundreds of um, scalar fields. So then this ball that was rolling down the hill rolls down in a multi-dimensional field landscape. So here I have a picture of um, a two-dimensional landscape. So this vertical axis is energy potential energy density, and here I have two dimension, two fields. Uh, each mini local minimum in this landscape corresponds to a vacuum state. And let's say that this minimum over here is our vacuum, and the inflaton rolls down this groove towards our vacuum. And this, this is when inflation happens. And the key point is that as it rolls down, it can tunnel through a barrier to some other minimum, right? So as the field, info, as the field rolls down hill towards our vacuum, a quantum tunneling is possible to this other vacuum over here. And we are going to discuss the consequences of this. Such tunneling processes were studied in a beautiful paper by Coleman and De Lucia. And here I have the same picture that I had on the last slide, uh, but shown more schematically. So this is the path of the inflaton. This is our vacuum, so an inflaton ends up here. And here is another vacuum, which is displaced in this other direction over here. I assume that the energy in the other vacuum is lower than the energy density during inflation. And you want to consider tunneling from this inflating path into this other vacuum. Yeah, and I assume that the energy of this other vacuum is positive and higher than the present vacuum energy density, which is what is called the dark energy and it is extremely small. Um, so Coleman and De Lucia showed that this tunneling occurs through bubble nucleation. So what happens is a tiny bubble 
filled with uh, this new vacuum of energy density rho b is formed and it immediately starts to expand. Now the reason it expands is because uh, the energy density outside is greater than inside and the um, as we discussed with the energy density also comes with energy density also comes negative pressure or tension so this tension pulls the difference in tension pulls the bubble wall outwards and as a result the bubble expands rapidly approaching the speed of light you could say from energetically you could say that as the bubble expands it eats up this high energy vacuum outside and the energy excess goes to accelerate the bubble wall so the bubble wall expands with acceleration all right so once the bubble is formed as i said is very tiny it uh, reaches the uh, Hubble radius, this uh, or this uh, horizon radius, H inverse, in less than a Hubble time. And after that, it expands exponentially, like everything during inflation. So for, bubble form, for a bubble formed at time, nucleated at time Tn, uh, the radius of this bubble is given by this. Horizon radius, times this exponential factor. And bubble nucleate at random uh, at a constant rate per space-time volume. So after a while, you will have a situation illustrated here. You'll have lots of bubbles of different sizes. These tiny bubbles are the ones that are just formed. And the bigger bubbles are the ones that formed earlier and that ha had already some time to expand. From this, uh, it is easy to figure out the size distribution of bubbles. So this is the distribution of bubble radii. Lambda is the dimensionless nucleation rate, which is the probability of bubble formation per Hubble volume per Hubble time. The Hubble volume is the volume of size H inverse, and Hubble time is the time H inverse. Um, and this distribution is constant during inflation. What changes are the limits where this distribution applies. The smallest bubble size is the smallest size of bubbles, which is about the horizon. And the largest bubble size depends on the duration of inflation, right? So between these two limits, the distribution is fixed. Um, and most of the, as I said, these smallest bubbles is about the horizon size, but most of the bubbles in the distributions in the, in the distribution are much bigger than the horizon because they expand exponentially. All right. Now, an interesting question. Yeah, we, we should imagine that all this is hap was happening in our present region of space when it was going through inflation. So these bubbles were forming and expanding in what was our present universe, and bubbles after inflation ends. So, uh, when inflation ends, outside of the bubbles, the energy of the inflaton is turned into hot plasma or radiation. So now we have the bubble surrounded by radiation. And uh, this radiation now has positive pressure. So it pushes on the bubble rather than pulling it outwards. Um, but the bubble initially, it was moving with a large Lorentz factor because it was accelerated. So it hits the radiation and it produces a shock wave like shown here, which is an expanding relativistic shell of matter. Right? It expands outwards. But uh, the bubble itself, now all forces on the bubble wall are pushing inwards. As I said, the radiation pressure pushes inwards and also the 
inside this bubble we have positive energy vacuum which has negative pressure which also pulls, pulls inwards so there is nothing to stop this bubble from collapsing <clears throat> and eventually it forms a black hole um, as we'll see there is more to this story because an interest yes um, if originally every bubble has size greater than the horizon yeah inflation stops and the bubbles eventually go to the stage of collapse so should they eventually pass again the horizon to reach the smaller size yeah sure they don't collapse immediately the bubble which is much bigger than the horizon has to wait until it comes within the horizon so it crosses it the horizon before it forms into black hole. Yes, we will okay. discuss this in a bit more detail. Thank you. Uh, so, an interesting question: What happens is what happens inside the bubble, um, and this depends on the maximum size that the bubble reaches. Uh, and we want to compare this size to this quantity h b inverse. Remember, H inverse was the uh, horizon during inflation, but now this vacuum inside the bubble is also positive energy vacuum, and it can, in principle, drive inflation. So this HB inverse is the horizon size the universe would have if it had inflation at this energy density rho b. Now, if the bubble expands to a radius less than this HB inverse, then it turns around and collapses to Schwarzschild singularity. So it forms a regular black hole. And uh, the mass of this black hole is just the energy of the vacuum inside the horizon at the end of inflation. So it is just this. Ri is the, initial, is the radius of the bubble when, infl <clears throat> when inflation ends. Um, but now, if the bubble expands to a radius bigger than this HB inverse, then its interior begins to inflate, right? Because the region near the center of the bubble doesn't know that it is a finite bubble because no communication is possible. So it inflates as it would if the entire space were filled with this vacuum. So the interior of the bubble expands exponentially, like this. And uh, this may at first seem a bit puzzling because the outside, we have radiation filled universe, which expands like square root of T and the interior expands exponentially. So how can this interior fit into that exterior? Um, but we know that in general relativity, space can be curved in interesting ways. And so what happens is illustrated in this cartoon. This is the bubble in the interior and it expands like a balloon. So this is like inflating baby universe. And it can exp expand exponentially to extremely large sizes. This green plane is the Friedman Robertson Walker universe outside, right? So it ex expands as normal Friedman, Friedman Robertson Walker universe. And these two are connected by this wormhole. Um, so the wormhole is seen as a black hole from outside. So an observer here would just see a black hole. This black ring is the Schwarzschild radius. And actually, if you have an observer inside, that observer will also see uh, this wormhole as a black hole. So it is kind of a double-sided black hole. Um, this uh, kind of geometry is uh, often called the bag of gold geometry. Um, so what this tells us is that bubbles bigger than a certain radius collapse, eventually form black holes, but these black holes have inflating universes inside. 
Unfortunately, the observer here does not see that universe. That observer just sees a black hole. Um, so the space-time structure here can be illustrated uh, using a Penrose diagram. Um, to understand these Penrose diagrams, uh, you need a bit of practice, um, but they're very useful to illustrate the causal structure of space-time because it represents the infinite uh, space-time in a finite diagram. So in this diagram, the uh, light propagates at 45 degrees angles. So it is very easy to see causal relations. Uh, <clears throat> Can I interrupt for a moment? Uh -huh. When we started, we started with an FRW inverse, one inverse with the FRW metric. But uh, suddenly we have gone into bubbles and the bubbles are being connected with a wormhole is this full setup? Is a it can't be a solution of an FRW universe, right? How did um, we change our space-time metric suddenly from FRW to something else? Uh, sorry. So uh, we we yeah we started with our universe with the FRW yeah. universe where there was one scalar field. Yes, I understand. It didn't go roll down to the vacuum, had a quantum roll down to another vacuum, and which you are interpreting as some sort of a bubble. But now the bubbles are also, the bubble and the space time are connected by a wormhole. And suddenly, yeah. I don't see that how the topology of the space time has changed. What drove this space time topology to be changed? Uh, wait, no, topology has not changed. So, and where uh, from the wormhole came? Sorry? Where from the wormhole came? Um, well, let's see. Uh, may, maybe, um, so first of all, the field rolled, uh, this green region where inflation ended, this is where the <coughs> field rolled down and uh, followed what uh, the scenario, usual inflationary scenario. But yeah. We also have a bubble, right, where the energy density is different, which evolves differently, right? So it's not surprising that this region evolves differently. Uh, so, so, so it means now, that the, the full, full universe is not with one space-time metric. We have patches in the universe, or each patch has a different space-time metric and space-time evolution. Is that what you are saying? Yes, the metric... Uh, in uh, inside is the sitter space. The metric okay. outside is kind of the Friedman Robertson Walker space. And they are connected by, well, obviously, since uh, the bubble expands faster, uh, its connection to this exterior region is non trivial. Right? Yeah. And, uh, yes. and it, is, it is illustrated here in this diagram. So here the uh, time is in this direction and space is in that direction and this horizontal line uh, at the bottom is the moment when inflation ends. This is equal to I. Uh, this blue region is the bubble. So the bubble radius is here and initially the bubble expands but then it quickly turns around and eventually it goes into that baby universe. And this represents the future infinity, future time infinity <clears throat> of this inflating universe because this bubble inflates forever. Um, <clears throat> now, this red line is the black hole singularity. This region outside on, on, also on the right, represents the Friedman Robertson Walker uh, universe. And, uh, and this region over here represents this wormhole region. The dotted, the dashed line is the shock wave. So the shock wave is sent from the bubble and it 
any time-like curves end up at this corner of the diagram. So this is a black line is the world line of some observer, right? So suppose we have an observer, we want to understand what this observer will see. Uh, this is the world line of observer, the world line ends up over there. Now, outside of the shock wave, the friedman robertson walker universe is unperturbed. So the observers here have no idea that something happened here before the shock wave reaches them. <clears throat> so, oops. So this observer has a brief window of opportunity to send a signal into the baby universe. So the signals propagate at 45 degree angles. So he can send a signal inside and he can even, even if he wants, he can jump inside. However, past this moment, from here, any signal that observer sends inwards ends up inside the black hole singularity. So, um, <clears throat> and uh, then eventually the observer encounters the shock wave and now he can see everything that happens, the perturbed region over here. Um, so, now I'm not sure that I answered question that uh, about this topology. The, the topology, uh, you could say that topology has changed because the singularity has appeared, but um, yeah. it was a continuous evolution. Yeah, I, I understand, I understand. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the main thing we were interested in, uh, in this uh, project was to figure out the mass distribution of black holes. So we want to know what is the mass of the black hole formed as a result. <clears throat> and um, this cannot be just uh, guessed from energy conservation because some energy could follow the bubble into the wormhole. So one needs to do a numerical simulation to figure that out. Mm. Before I tell you about numerical simulations, uh, one can relatively easily fi figure out the upper bound on the black hole mass. Um, this shock radius expands because the shock is initially bigger than the horizon, its radius. So it expands as the friedman robertson walker scale factor with square root of t. And from that, you can figure out at what radius this shock comes within the horizon. It turns out to be given by this. Ri is the initial size of the bubble at the time ti. So this is the radius of the shock when it comes within the horizon. And now at that time, if a black hole is formed, it has to be inside. So the Schwarzschild radius of the black hole should be smaller than this. And so its mass has to be <clears throat> smaller than this. So the maximum mass of the black hole formed from a bubble of initial radius Ri is this. Okay. But now we want to know what mass actually is. Um, and uh, we did, I did numerical simulations with my student, Helling Den. It was a very challenging simulation and, and Helling did a wonderful work, wonderful job there. <clears throat> so I will only very uh, briefly outline what we did there. So the exterior region outside the bubble, we just take the general spherical asymmetric metric. And uh, this region is filled with radiation. So the equation of state is P equal rho over three. And we use <clears throat> co-moving coordinates, right? So the velocity, the, the bubble, the velocity of matter is zero. Um, we also, assume that radiation cannot penetrate the bubble. So it is reflected from the bubble wall, which is a reasonable assumption, at least in a wide class of models, because if you have say photon hitting the bubble, inside the bubble, this photon 
uh, is a different particle which has typically a large mass, so it cannot penetrate it, it bounces back. Um, so, and as a result, the bubble wall in this coordinate is also at a fixed radius. Now the interior radius, the interior region is the sitter space. So it is an exponentially expanding universe. And we match these two metrics using the, what is called the Israel's matching conditions, which were worked out by Werner Israel. Um, and that's it. Uh, and uh, when the black hole is formed, we figure this out by the appearance of the apparent horizon or in other words, by appearance of trapped surfaces. So I, let me show some uh, snapshots because it's an interesting pictures. So this is very shortly after the uh, end of inflation when the bubble hits the radiation. The vertical axis is the energy density. Uh, this point on the left is the bubble wall. Uh, and and the vertical x is actually the energy density divided by the Friedman Robertson Walker density. So in this region, you just have Friedman Robertson Walker, and it looks like almost zero because uh, the, but when the bubble hits radiation, it produces the shock with extremely high energy density, which is more than 100 times greater than the FRW. And then this shock propagates outwards and its den energy density decreases. Um, in less than a Hubble time, the region next to the wall evacuates. So the energy density drops below the FRW, right? And this is not surprising, right? Because the bubble hits radiation. So this radiation goes off. Um, but then at a later time, by the time the black hole is formed, this region near the black hole fills up to energy density comparable to that of exterior. <clears throat> so, and this is at way later times. You have basically what happens is that you have a now relatively weak shock wave, uh, and it consists of an overdense region, overdense shell over here. Which represented by this dark shell, followed by underdense shell, which is this lighter shell, and this propagates on the background of FRW. Okay. Um, so, but as I said, what we are interested mainly is the black hole mass. And once apparent horizon is formed from this radius of the horizon, you can tell what the mass is. And this plot shows the black hole mass in units of this maximum mass that I mentioned. This is the bound that I discussed uh, as a function of the initial radius of the bubble. So for small radii, the mass is given by this formula. This was as expected, right? This is just goes like volume times the um, energy density inside the bubble. For large radii, you see that this m over m max saturates a number one. So basically, it tells us that the black holes, large bubbles form black holes of pretty much the maximum mass that they can. So we have these two equations. This is at large radii, this is at small radii. And from this, we can figure out when the transition region is. And it occurs at, at what Ri it occurs and at what M it occurs. It turns out that <clears throat> this transition mass, M star, is given by this formula. You can figure this out easily from there. And uh, you see it is, depends on the energy density during inflation and energy density inside the bubble. And depending on these microphysical parameters, this M star can take a huge range of values from a few grams to basically bigger than the mass of the entire visible universe. And we're going to treat it as a free parameter because this, this depends on microphysics. 
Now, given the, uh, so this tells us the black hole mass as a function of the radius, initial radius of the bubble. And now we can uh, figure out the mass distribution of black holes. <clears throat> um, this distribution is uh, usually characterized by this function f of m, which gives the fraction of dark matter density in the form of black holes of mass of order m. So dn dm times m is the density of black holes of mass of order m. Multiplied by another m, this gives you the mass density and divided by the density of dark matter, this is the fraction the black holes take from dark matter. And the this is a convenient parameter because it doesn't change with time, right? Because the black holes and dark matter densities evolve in the same way. And in order to find this distribution, uh, we now have all we need because we know the initial distribution of bubbles at the end of inflation. And we know the mass of the black hole as a function of the bubble radius, right? And it's an easy task to figure this out. We get a pretty simple form for this f of m. It has different forms, of course, of course, for m less than m star and m greater than m star, where m star is that uh, transition radius from one regime to another. Um, lambda here is the nucleation rate of bubbles, and m eq is the mass within the horizon at the time of equal matter and radiation densities, turns out to be 10 to the 17 solar masses. <coughs> so you see that for m greater than m star, this distribution depends on a single parameter, which is lambda, nucleation rate of black holes, uh, of bubbles. And uh, for m smaller than m star, this distribution is constant. It's independent of mass. So you see it's a horizontal line here. So overall, the distribution depends on three parameters. Uh, one is lambda, the other is m star, where a transition occurs. And the last parameter is the cutoff parameter m minimal, which is the minimal black hole mass, which is the mass of black holes of radius of order the horizon at the end of inflation. Okay, so we have a rather simple mass distribution. And notice that this distribution is extremely wide, right? It, uh, this m min is typically a pretty small mass. And this extends to very large, basically to infinite masses, um, and decreases uh, relatively mildly with mass. Okay, so uh, this is basically the predictions of the model, right? And we are going to treat these parameters as free parameters because they are determined by microphysics which is unknown. Uh, so now I want to discuss how um, to compare this scenario with uh, observations. Um, black hole observations actually present us with a number of puzzles. Um, one is the existence of supermassive black holes. Uh, these are observed at the centers of most galaxies and have masses from million to about 10 billion solar masses. Um, interestingly, these huge black holes are already present at high redshifts, when the redshifts are about five to seven. And uh, one uh, simple way to explain the existence would be to say that, okay, black holes formed by usual process of stellar collapse 
and then they accrete matter and grow to these large sizes. But it seems that there is not enough time for them to grow from stellar mass black holes to this huge size to be already there at these high redshifts that they are observed. Another interesting observation, which of course uh, everybody heard about, is the observations by LIGO and Virgo of uh, gravitational waves of in spiraling and colliding black holes. So these are pairs of black holes which rotate around one another, lose energy by gravitational radiation and eventually collide. And this final collision process produces a burst of gravitational radiation, uh, which gave Nobel Prize to these guys, which is well deserved. Um, now, the, uh, amazingly, from this signal, uh, the observers can uh, get a lot of information about the black holes. They can figure out their masses and their spins. And this brought some surprises. The masses were larger than everybody expected. Oops. And uh, they were about 30 solar masses for most of them. And also they were very slowly rotating. <clears throat> Actually, for, for many of these black holes, observations are consistent with zero spin. Uh, on the other hand, the expectation was that uh, stellar black holes should be nearly maximally rotating. Um, and the final puzzle I want to mention is uh, the dark matter, which may or may not be related to black holes, but we know that uh, dark matter uh, has density about five times greater than ordinary matter. We know that it cannot be made of ordinary uh, standard model, part model particles. Um, now, this shows the dark matter halo about around the gal galaxy. Uh, and it could be that the dark matter is made up of some unknown particles, uh, but so far all attempts to detect these particles have failed. And uh, so naturally people discuss the idea that uh, the dark matter is made up of primordial black holes formed in the early universe. They could not be stellar black holes. Um, okay, so now we can try to address uh, these issues with, um, yeah, no, before I go into that, yeah, we, we can try to address these issues with these black hole scenario formation that I described. Uh, before I want to uh, discuss some bounds, there is a tremendous amount of work that went in determining bounds on the density of black holes in uh, all mass ranges. And this is uh, the present situation uh, with the colored regions are the excluded regions. So at small, ma th this is horizontal axis is the mass in grams. <laughs> and this is the, this parameter F that the fraction of mass in the form of black holes. Um, so this small, at small masses, the main bound comes from Hawking evaporation of black holes, right, which produces gamma rays. Um, so this region is excluded. At largest masses, uh, Planck observations uh, give a constraint uh, due to, because if, if you have large black holes present, uh, accretion on these black holes leads to radiation which would distort the CMB spectrum and that's the bound coming from that. All these other bounds are due to uh, microlensing. Uh, so if the black hole passes between the observer and the star, the star is gravitationally lensed and its brightness 
sharply increases for a brief period of time. So you see that uh, only two windows are left. This is a small window and this exist existence actually is disputed um, at about 100 solar masses. And there is another window at well below. So solar mass is about 10 to the th 33 grams. So it is about here. Uh, so there is another window where black holes can account for all dark matter. Okay. So here I show the uh, distribution suggested by this scenario that I described uh, for some values of parameters that can address some of these puzzles. Um, so uh, this um, is uh, for M star what a solar mass and lambda, I can actually, cannot actually see lambda, what it is 10 to the minus 12 here. Uh, lambda, this nucleation rate of uh, bubbles, is a small parameter because tunneling is a process that is exponentially suppressed. So we expect this lambda to be very small. Um, and uh, also the parameters I chose here so that F is a water 10 to the minus 3 in this region because this is what is required to get the uh, binaries observed uh, uh, by LIGO at the observed rate, right? So with this distribution, we would have binaries uh, explained by Li uh, detected by LIGO, but also we can explain the supermassive black holes because we can ask with this distribution, what would be the largest black hole that we can expect to find in a galaxy. So basically we look at this distribution and say at what mass the density of these black holes is the same as the density of galaxies. And one finds that it is about a million solar masses. And this mass is uh, quite enough for this black hole to grow by accretion and reach the size of 10 billion solar masses. So this distribution can explain both the um, LIGO observations and uh, the supermassive black holes. Now this other, this dashed line is for a different set of parameters. And here uh, it uh, can account for dark matter. It, it cannot account for LIGO or for supermassive black hole, but it can account for dark matter. It doesn't quite reach one here, but it still accounts for dark matter because it's, it's an extended distribution. So uh, it actually does. But these will be pretty small black holes with masses about 10 to the 19 grams. Okay, so uh, another observational prediction of this scenario is um, spectral distortion of the uh, CMB. Um, so remember this picture where this overdense shell pH followed by underdense shell. So the temperature in overdense shell is higher then the CMB temperature, and then this one is lower. And uh, photons diffuse from uh, these shells, between the shells and from outside and so forth. And there, as a result, uh, the spectrum of the photons is changed. And uh, one uh, manifestation of this is that photons that develop a chemical potential. This is so-called mu distortion. Um, the, uh, this distortion occurs only in regions surrounding the black holes formed by bubbles. And so one expects to find a spiky uh, spectral distortion. It will be, uh, you'll have pretty much no distortion everywhere except there will be some spots where you observe uh, detectable distortion. 
And you, you can calculate the average distortion if you just do kind of a lower resolution measurement and it turns out to be tiny. Uh, but the spikes uh, should be quite detectable. Uh, so this is a prediction of this scenario which uh, uh, may show that, uh, which may confirm it or rule it out. Uh, let me notice that there are other scenarios of primordial black hole formation during inflation where uh, instead of these uh, localized bubbles, uh, you have uh, some feature in the inflaton potential which produces large fluctuation, density fluctuation on some range of narrow range of scales. And uh, these scenarios have run into trouble precisely due to this spectral distortion. And the reason is that uh, they tend to produce distortion all over the space. And in order to get black holes, you need pretty large density fluctuations on those scales. And um, that leads to large spectral distortions. Uh, in this black hole scenario, this problem doesn't arise because the spectral distortion is localized in these small patches. Okay, the last thing I want to tell you about is the implication of this scenario <coughs> for the large scale structure of space time. Um, so we have this picture of a baby universes connected by wormholes to uh, our space. But then these universes expand uh, forever. And in principle, they can form bubbles of other vacua over here by tunneling. And these bubbles will expand and also produce black holes connected by wormholes to other baby universes. So the resulting structure of space-time can be kind of an artist's perception can be represented by this. This picture was made by Andre Linde to illustrate something else, but uh, I think it fits this pretty well. So we have expanding regions like suppose we are in this region and we see wormholes we see black holes but they are connected to wormholes they're connected to other expanding universe which are in turn connected to other baby universes and so forth um, now notice uh, that even if uh, the nucleation rate of bubbles is extremely small suppose this lambda is so small that there are no uh, bubbles were formed in our observable part of the universe. Still, uh, they will be formed on some distance scale during inflation. And so this picture is pretty much inevitable. Um, it may describe the universe on, on huge distance scales, but uh, it seems that you cannot avoid it. Uh, so I have a question. Uh huh. So I'm going to start back one more. Yeah. Can you put slide back one more? Yeah. So you said like uh, this white color region, and there we have this black ring, and it's a wormhole, but we see it as a black hole. Yes. But now I am thinking like if we have if it is a black hole and we have two black holes which is merging together then what will happen with two other big universe like black hole is somehow like a way to going to another another bubble and if we have something like two of this kind of picture and these black holes are merging what will happen with this big big red bubble uh, this is an interesting question uh, the answer is i don't know okay uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, uh, I think uh, just causally, uh, this merger cannot, it cannot, can only affect what happens 
over here. It cannot affect this uh, mm. baby universe. Mm. Um, but um, the wormholes, obviously, the wormholes will have to merge. Yeah, mm. it, it, it's an interesting question. Yes, uh, I think it's uh, excuse me, I want to comment on this question. So, for observer who lives in Friedman universe, he doesn't really aware, he's not aware of baby of these bubbles. For him, they're just black holes. And all that he detect and be aware of is just the usual black hole interior. While for observers who would probably sunk in sight or who would be using this possibility of the black hole formation during the bubble, contraction when the shock wave passes for that bub uh, for that observer who would travel to that baby universe that observer would be aware of the existence of baby universe for our world observers this baby universe simply out of any causal connection I think. Uh, yeah i agree that uh, it, for 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 observers uh, in our space over here uh, we will not see anything unusual we will see just the merger of two black holes would it be correct to say that for observers living in this green, like Friedman, Robertson, Volcker universe, these bubbles, they simply do not exist in, the, in all possible causal ways. So the observers observe just usual black holes. That's right. But still, it is uh, an interesting conceptual uh, yeah, yeah. question of what, how the space-time structure changes when black hole merger uh, occurs because basically it is a wormhole merger right and uh, that's uh, it's not clear what's happening here i have a slightly different question so as i understood you mentioned that because of large mass of supermassive black holes detected nearly in every galaxy you suggest that these black holes would be rather not the result of inflation but this formation from the bubbles right um well uh, the black black holes can be, as I said, black holes can be formed in inflationary scenarios in different ways, and uh, people discuss that possibility as well. But uh, this runs into this problem with spectral distortions, so um, it may or may not be avoidable. Yeah, well, what I was wondering if you consider the tunneling process and the probability of it is quite low for for really eventually high mass, because that would be nearly heavy uh, classical objects, so the probability would be highly exponentially suppressed, then I would naively argue that the larger black hole is in the mass, there would be less probable as its, its existence. And now if you take into account the vast majority of galaxies and think that every galaxy supermassive black hole or nearly every has that uh, post state of being formed from the bubble, which is very improbable, then altogether it makes it very improbable. Now, let's see. You're saying that uh, the formation of uh, large black holes will be suppressed in this uh, scenario that I discussed? Yes. Uh, well, uh, actually, no, because the bu all bubbles are formed in the same way. They have the same size at formation. And the tunneling process is the same. The, the difference between large bubbles and small bubbles is that the large, large bubbles were formed earlier and they have more time to expand. But what is the probability of the tunneling and the bubble formation even of the smallest size, which is roughly the Hubble horizon or the Sitter horizon? Well, is it a very small volume? Well, here uh, I... Uh, this well, yeah, it is a, typically it is a small value because the uh, tunneling uh, is typically a semi is a semi classical process. It's exponentially suppressed, uh, but uh, the exact value depends on microphysics. Depends on the shape of this potential barrier. So right. the value I used here is ten to the minus twelve, which is a small number, but in principle. Lambda can be a lot smaller than that, and then we are not going to see any of these black holes. And then larger black hole mass is because of the scenario of the formation that would be less probable formation of such black hole. That would be an additional contribution to lambda, right? right? No, no, because lambda is the, this is, let's see, 
we have this picture over here, right? So we have large bubbles, we have small bubbles. This large bubble was small like this when it is formed. So the formation process is exactly the same for all bubbles. And the formation probability is exactly the same. Um, and then the bubbles just expand and you get this size distribution. Right, what I mean by a, a mass of the, uh, each bubble contains. So do you say that they're all the same masses before they inflated and changed their sizes or nearly the same? Wait, the, uh, first uh, we have the distribution of sizes and at the end of inflation, the distribution of sizes is still this. Then we can ask, given the size of the bubble, what is the mass of the black hole uh, that is formed? And this is what I discussed here. So the mass of the black hole, this is initial size of the bubble at the end of inflation. And the mass of the black hole is given by this for small masses and by that for large masses, right? So for large masses, which is, uh, if you are talking about supermassive black holes, this is what we are interested in. It just uh, proportional to the square of the initial radius. Oh, okay, so the mass does not come in the process of tunneling in this scenario. Right, the process okay. of tunneling is the same for all bubbles. Okay, okay, thank you. So I was missing this point, thank you. Okay, so I think this brings me to my conclusion. So let me just restate. Uh, so what I tried to convince you of is that vacuum bubbles may nucleate during inflation. And this leads to formation of black holes with a very wide spectrum of masses. Now, most of these black holes have inflating universes inside although we don't get to see them. Now, if we discover black holes with this predicted <coughs> distribution of masses, uh, this will, first of all, this will provide evidence for inflation because there is no other scenario that can produce a spectrum like this. And uh, also it will give evidence for non-trivial space-time structure. Indirect, right? But you know, if we believe that this distribution of black holes was produced by this process, then they must contain these baby universes inside. Um, now these black holes may act as seeds for supermassive black holes. They may account for dark matter and they may have formed the boundaries, uh, the bi binaries observed by LIGO. They can do, cannot do all three of these things, but can, they can do two. And uh, also the scenario predicts spiky spectral distortions. And also the thing that I didn't talk about, early formation of massive halos. Um, you see, if you have these large black holes in the early universe, they are there before any density fluctuations could have uh, collapsed to form bound objects. So, and they will accrete more matter and, and grow, right? So basically you expect to see formation of massive objects earlier than area predicts. Okay, so this is all I wanted to tell you. So, <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Alex, for your nice uh, explanation and detailed talk. And uh, I would request all the speakers to unmute yourself and give a clap for the speaker for giving such a nice talk. And uh, now you can ask question if you want to ask more questions to him, because we have time. Uh, yeah, you please ask questions. Don't need to uh, raise hand. You can directly ask questions. Okay. Yeah. Can I, can I have a question? Uh, so, uh, space-time torsion in the Einstein-Cartan theory of gravity 
can generate gravitational repulsion. So could the process uh, and mechanism you described in your talk could be caused by torsion instead of inflaton field? Um, you know, I, I don't, uh, I'm not really uh, well familiar with this theory, so I didn't know that it can uh, cause uh, repulsion. But uh, uh, if it can, maybe you can um, construct an inflationary scenario based on that. So basically, I, it could be any inflation, uh, not by inflaton, but any inflation could be responsible for this mechanism. Maybe, but d does this theory has a have a de Sitter solution? Uh, um, it can, not always, but there are some special cases. Yeah, so if it has a de Sitter solution, and so you need two things. You need a de Sitter solution and you need some way for it to end, right? Uh, so yeah. it could be. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Alex, what about the bouncing cosmology? Because it has also the de Sitter solution, I think. Uh, well, bouncing, uh, in order to have a bounce, you need a violation of um, null convergence condition yeah. or weak energy condition, whatever, whatever you call it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that uh, Usual kind of uh, field theories do not give you that. True. Um, ordinary inflation scenario, uh, like in the Sita space, you, you don't have violations of no convergence condition. So, um, but uh, but the bounce is something else, right? You can have inflation and before inflation, you can have a bounce because there is a theorem that says that inflation inflation is generically eternal to the future, so it never stops in the entire space. This is what is called eternal inflation, but there is a theorem which says that it cannot be eternal to the past. So inflation must have some sort of a beginning, and one possibility is that the universe was contracting, and then it bounced and started to inflate. But the physics of this bounce is uh, unknown, right? So you just speculate on what causes it. Thank you. And uh, uh, any other question, please, people ask. I have yes, one. Yeah. Please, please <clears throat> ask. I would like to ask whether our universe uh, could be inside a black hole surrounded uh, by a universe with a still lower uh, dark energy density, I mean, lower uh, vacuum energy density. Uh, let's see, if the universe can contain a black hole, could, could you repeat this? Sorry, sorry I yes. didn't get If If our universe might be a black hole inside a universe with a lower uh, energy density, I mean, yeah, sure. We, we can, uh, according to uh, this picture, let's say, if this is our universe, right? Uh, and someone lives in, in this other universe, then for them, uh, we live inside of a black hole. Mm. Yeah. Right? I think this scenario makes this inevitable that we live inside of a black hole of some other universe. Mm, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I have one question. Is, uh, is yeah, this, or this? So, sorry, before that, somebody had one more question, then you will ask. Uh, um, Andre, do you have a question? Yes, <clears throat> I was asking a question, but I did not want to interrupt because I already asked a few questions. So is no, it okay no, no. if I ask one more? If please ask, then the other guy will ask the question. Yeah, thank you. So uh, would you please uh, repeat that scenario? I'm particularly interested. Why do we have eventually collapse of the bubble? <clears throat> so there would be like analog of hoop conjecture or something. What actually triggers the collapse? Because eventually there can be some internal pressure that may stop it. 
So th this is the time I'm interested. Um, let's see. Uh, well, actually, there is no internal pressure. Uh, th this um, there is an external pressure, right? So there is radiation outside, uh, which exerts pressure on the on the bubble. Inside the bubble, you have this vacuum equation of state, which has negative pressure. So this negative pressure doesn't push outward, it pulls inward. So all forces acting on the bubble wall are directed inwards. So there is nothing to stop the collapse. But once the matter goes inside of the bubble, does it happen in your scenario? Well, in, in this, uh, we made the assumption. We made the assumption here that the particles are reflected from the bubble wall, right? So matter okay. does not get I see. Uh, so into the bubble. Wall. But uh, to say that Helen the Dan, who, sorry, Helen Dan, who collaborated with me on this, he later wrote a paper uh, where he discussed the scenario, uh, opposite scenario, where particles. Uh, interact with the bubble only gravitationally, so they freely move in into the bubble and can they can move in and go back and uh, uh, you see I I even if particles get into the bubble uh, they can get out equally easily so they it's not like they are inside of a bag and will push on the bubble wall. So if they can go in, they will go out as well. So they will not exert pressure on the bubble wall. But if you have flux of external matter radially inside of the bubble, plus the bubble contracts, that for mm -hmm. that coming matter, there would be probably growing uh, positive uh, external pressure that may eventually halt the collapse. So I don't see the possibility if you allow matter come on site, but why it is always excluded that the matter eventually would not reach certain external pressure that would overbalance the bubble contraction. And well, uh, I mean, uh, what happens, at least for large bubbles, suppose matter comes in, but the bubble starts to inflate, right? So the density, as the bubble inflates, the density of matter is diluted. But the density of vacuum is not diluted. The density of vacuum is always constant. So very quickly, the density of that matter that went in becomes negligible. Oh, okay. So in your scenario, because of this inflation, it always overcomes the potential uh, contraction of any kind of internal flux of matter, right? Right. Okay, thank you. Now the, I didn't know the name, Galaxy yeah. should be a two zero. Who is that? Sorry? Your name is appearing as Galaxy A20. Who is? Yeah, it's Shubham. Uh, oh. Actually, I have another question. Is like, when we have two universes and they are connected with this wormhole, is it possible to have a, you know, like a independent universe, like without connection? Because in picture, in the cartoonish picture, Every universe is connected with another one. So, is there any possible situation where it is not connected with anyone? The last um, seven slides. Like. Oh, uh, you you mean that? Uh, can we have some kind of balloon here, which is disconnected? Yeah. Uh, that uh, we should, right? Because black holes evaporate. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, in the end. Uh, they become disconnected, but um, at the same time, the number of connections grows, right? Because mm -hmm. black hole uh, comes. Yeah. So yeah, but in principle, yeah, they 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 will be disconnected bubbles. Hmm. And then I was thinking, like, okay, if these are connected with black hole. So then it is nearly impossible to make a communication between two universes because when you're going towards black hole, there is no chance to come back except Hawking radiation. So even if I want to travel from this universe to another universe, I have to collapse into black hole, but how I will come out? 
Well, you, you cannot even, uh, you, even if you are willing to go in, mm -hmm. uh, you are going to hit the singularity because um, uh, of this Penrose diagram. Mm -hmm. right? It's only right after the end of inflation you can go in. But, okay. Okay. but once you are here, you can only go if you go in, you will get to the singularity, but you're not going to get in there. Mm. So it's not accessible somehow. <laughs> not accessible, right. Because, because as I said, you see external observers <laughs> see the, them as black holes. And mm. observationally, they are no way different. Interesting. Yeah. At the last, uh, would you, uh, can you suggest some sort of like literature or something at the last, like which we can get more information about it to do for more research or something to read up? Uh, you mean, uh, you want me to give you references or? Yeah, some sort of like literature or paper where I can really get a bit more information about it. Uh, it's an interesting topic and quite new well, th th there are. Well, if you look uh, on the archive, uh, so you should look into his paper. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. If you, if you look at the archive, there is this. Uh, uh, where is it, boy? Yeah, there is a paper, this Gariga. Yeah, if you look at the uh, archive with, for my, with my name, mm -hmm. then uh, you will see some, about four or five papers on this subject. And they are relatively recent. They are all like uh, 2017 to 2019. Okay, okay. So guys, you Thank have you. more questions? No more questions? Then uh, I, uh, we, uh, so Alex, thank you for your time and uh, uh, for giving such a nice uh, introduction to this subject and uh, for a, such a nice talk and the discussion. Hope you have also enjoyed the discussion. And uh, yeah, so stay safe, be healthy, and uh, hopefully things will be very uh, going to the positive direction very soon. And uh, yeah, so I would now uh, suggest all the participants to. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, end this because I need to talk to the speaker. So you please go out from. Okay, thank you. It was a pleasure. Have a nice time. Yeah. Yes, so just I, I, uh, I have to.